did we not teach you anything? <laughs> hey, I think it was your internet because somebody requested as well as you. I tried yeah. to add you and it said waiting and then some poor person I accepted and she literally just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we finally made it. And there's more people on now anyway. Here we are. Look, congratulations. Thank I literally... You. I'm just going to turn you up. There you go. Listen, a few months ago, I would have said that I love this book out of obligation because... <laughs> my dog now. Gosh, this is going terribly well, isn't it? Um, my dog's going crazy because someone's knocking at my door. Um, but you won't mind that because you like dogs. Right, talk to me about Battle Ready. Why? Can you hear over my dog barking? Yeah, I've got my dog's here and he's, he can hear your dog. <laughs> Murphy. Um, um, talk to me about Battle Ready then. Why did you want to do it? Because the first book, you laid so much of your life out there. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a hell of a life, Ollie. Yeah. Why did you feel the need to, to do a follow-up? Well, really, the first book, Breakpoint, was, was really laying the land. You know, it, it was an autobiography about, um, well, it started, it, it wasn't really just a military book. It was about, it started at 10 years old. And it was the, my journey up until, um, you know, up until the moment I wrote it. So, um, you know, it's, it's 40, it was 48 years of, uh, of, uh, of story in there. Um, so it's very much laying the land. It was the foundation. Now, the second book, uh, Battle Ready, is this, is the, this book is a call to action. It's a war cry against procrastination, against hesitation. And it's, it's, a, it's a, like I said, it's a call to action. So this is actually shares a process that I went through when I came back to the UK, 2014, 2015. And I realized that I needed to make some changes. You know, there'd been some quite negative ha uh, programming and habit loops I'd, I'd, um, I'd, uh, I was repeating over time. And I, I knew that the only way to stop those habit loops and achieving what I wanted in life was to, was to change the blueprint. And I, so, I know that sounds quite bizarre, but I basically put myself into a boot camp where there was no distractions, no nothing. And, um, and I, I went about um, changing um, those habit loops. So basically, when I talk about habit loops, it's the fact that everyone knows about setting goals. We all say, you know, whether that's going to the gym, whether that's starting a new job, a relationship, whatever it is, we know that we have a little honeymoon period, don't we? And then all of a sudden, two weeks down track, um, we've, we've lost motivation and we go back to our comfort zones. So it was, it was, it was, I wanted to change my life. I wanted to have, a, you know, a different life than I'd had been having for years. And, um, you know, which was, was, was pretty, pretty much a trail of destruction amongst the good stuff I did. Um, and the only way to do that was change the blueprint, start instilling some disciplines into my daily routine that would last a lifetime. And I'm still doing those disciplines today. So the things that I put myself through, 2015 that are in the book and I asked you to do with me um you know I'm still doing that process today so yeah and I think that's what's useful about this book is that there's literally exercises where you you write stuff down and I think you have for anybody yeah. reading you have to kind of do a bit of self-examining don't you and actually put down put it down in ink and see it in black and white I mean I'm sure lots of people I don't want to call this a, a self-help book but there's there's elements of and this in other self-help books of people identifying and assessing behaviours. But I guess for you, it was important to encourage people to find a way to make those behaviours habit. Like, how yeah. hard is it to, like you said, anyone can do something good for two weeks in January. We all cut back on the drinking and exercise. But how do you maintain that? Yeah. And that's, that's really, for me, the book is split into four parts. And first, I think it's, um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to read the titles uh, verse for verse, but basically it's identifying what the issue is. And then it's identifying the barriers that, that are in your way. And then it's the taking action part. And then it's the really important one is sustaining that, that training. Because, you know, everything, we, we, we come, we go around the cycle every year. And we go back to the same thing every year, at Christmas and, New, you know, whenever it is. And you say, right, this is going to be my year. And so many people are not living to the full potential. Or I certainly wasn't, you know, not until I put some strict discipline in. For me to start, you know, and, and when I say discipline, you know, sometimes I slack, you know, and that's fine. It's fine to do that. But and that's why the book's called Battle Ready. It's not about going to a war zone. It's about my bat my battle is every day to try and be a better version of myself each day. So and like I say, you know, some days slip like today, 
Yesterday, I got up at five o'clock. I went through my routine, everything. Um, and today, I don't set my alarm clock because I'm, I'm in the mindset that if I do need that extra sleep, I should give it to myself. And that extra sleep, like this morning, I got up an hour and a half later. You know, so that's half past six. What a crazy lion that was. <laughs> you wild thing, you. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, it's, it's about maintaining some kind of discipline because, you know, we, we, we're all fighting to, we should be fighting to, to improve our lives in every aspect. So it's about whatever, that book is personal to everyone that buys it. And that's why there's so many books out there. They talk about mindset and talk about this, that and the other. That book, because it's the exercises that question you, makes it personal to you or the reader. And I think it's applicable to a lot of people in that it'd be easy to, to look at a book like this on the shelf and think, OK, I'm not a bloke of a certain age who's, you know, battling drink. Therefore, that book's a bit too hardcore for me. That isn't actually what, because I'll be honest, when I first started to turn the pages, I thought, oh, this isn't going to really identify with me. But actually, mm. it's very applicable to a lot of people. I think even people who kind of, you know, there's a lot of my generation look at Instagram and think everyone else's life is better or everyone everyone else's grass is greener mm. and I think there's probably a lot of useful techniques in here for anybody to kind of like you say make the, the best version of their own life what was that quote you said about procrastination because I actually circled that in here the, the war cry against the war cry to procrastination and hesitation and that's what it is you know and that's that's the whole thing because what you've got to really do, and this really goes back to my first book, Breakpoint, because that identify what is a breakpoint. A breakpoint basically is when you, it's, it's when you get to that crossroads. Now we're all tuned to avoid stress, avoid discomfort, and any time we do, you know, you, we get to anything hard, and that could be anything. You know, it's, again, it doesn't. It, it's, it's usually I always push the fact it's about the small stuff. Take care of the small stuff. Big stuff take, takes care of itself. But you know, for instance, if you want to start getting fitter, you know you are not gonna be motivated to do it. You'll have a small honey, honeymoon period window, but then before long, unless you take action, you know, and even when you do take action, you're not gonna be motivated all the time. And people complain, you know, where'd you get your motivation? I don't have constant motivation. But the thing is, that's why Breakpoint is really when you switch off the programming here and you follow your heart to what you, you, know, you know, to what really, really, you follow your beliefs and you follow what your goal is. And then you switch off the messaging up here. Do you think everybody has to have a crisis point, though, to realise that they need to change things? Or can you just be kind of ambling along and thinking, I'm all right, but you've still got potential to, to make your mindset better and benefit your life? Everyone should be looking to improve it. I think when you get to the stage where you plateau and say, everything's cool, I'm fine, I think that's dangerous, a dangerous place to be. Because as, as humans, we're not supposed to sit there and plateau. You know what I mean? It's, it's like when, you, when you've created goals, and I keep saying this to, you know, when, you, when you've actually reached your goal, and this was very much the same for me, when I actually passed Special Forces Selection, it was a two-year process for me through a little bit of an altercation with a Welsh farmer. I won't go into it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, by the time, when I actually got to the end, I was, I was kind of deflated. And that's how you should be. It was a goal. Once you got to your goal, it's not about going, right, that's it, I've, that's me done. You know, and, and, and there's a lot of people that do that. You know, they achieve something great in life and they're, they're forever then, for the rest of their life moving forward, talking about how good they were back then. You know, it, for me. It's easy, to, it's easy for us to get frustrated with our contemporaries when, you know, you maybe have the family and the nice house and the nice mm. job. People who are always looking for the next thing. Yeah. It's, but oh, they always want something else. They always want the next best car. They always want the next mm. best this. But actually, maybe it doesn't have to be about the next best thing being a consumer good. Maybe it can be. No. Um, and that, yeah, that's. Can I just say on that as well, Helen? That's really important because, and I've done that. You know, we chase an image. You know, whether that's a house, a car, the the you know, the, keeping up with the Joneses. We chase that image of the perfect lifestyle. And, you know, it's not the image. It's not the material objects we, we, we're chasing. It's the feeling. It's the feeling of fulfillment, of, of happiness, etc. I know it's a cliche. Everyone says, oh, money doesn't, um, you know, bring you happiness. It, it is so true. It doesn't bring you happiness. You know, you've got to have the feelings that match that. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really about everyone is addicted on chasing the image and it's not the image. And, and for me, you know, it was, I stumbled across what, what made me happy, made, uh, fulfilled me. And that was, you know, and, and my purpose, it's really, it's really um, important that we, we discover what our purpose is. And that for me was when, not in the special forces, that for me was when I went over and um, 
I rescued those kids in Thailand from, from slavery and prostitution and, and the power of helping other people. You know, that's, that's when I really hit, hit the nail on the head for me, so. That, that's what I want us to get into. I just want to say hello, Northern Carolina. Hello, Lewis in Scotland. Hello, Gretna, place close to my heart. Um, let's, because I don't want this to sound like it's full of like strict exercises and you almost analyze yourself. If you're quite happy with your life, and lots of people are, and they're quite happy on the plateau, this is also a, a very good storybook. I mean, you, you threw it in there like a bit of confetti at the beginning. Oh, yeah, the start of my life with the incident with the chimp and then to now. <laughs> you, the incident with the chimp is yeah. very significant. If people yeah. don't know the story, can you talk us through it? Yeah, yeah, well, and, um, you know, I do tell, I don't get bored of telling this story because it is so significant. And, and just the fact, one thing I'll say about trauma um, and traumatic incidents what we tend to do, what we're wired to do, is lock away that intimate trauma. It's just the way we're wired. And really, I think that is, that, that is when it comes to the likes of PTSD, and that's not owned by the military, by the way. Uh, when it comes to PTSD, whatever the incident is, um, you know, the fact we lock that tra the, the emotional trauma away, I think that's, that's, that's where the danger starts. Because at some point, unless you address it, it is going to come out. Now, for me... Um, I, an incident happened in my life which really blocked out most of my childhood. I can't remember a lot before the age of 10. Um, and I was, it was a bizarre um, incident. I was in Burton-on-Trent, Staffordshire, and I went down to the... Uh, I was going swimming with my brother and his best mate, uh, and I stumbled... You know, we came across the circus that was setting up in town. Um, super excited. And then we, I went in the, the big top, and then I suddenly got split up from my brother and everything. I was compelled to go to this opening. And as I peeked through, there was a beautiful little baby chimp. And for me, you know, I've been brought up with cats and dogs. But for me, this was like, um, it, was like it was like something from Hollywood because I, I was addicted to Tarzan at 10 years old. So I went towards it. And, uh, and then I started interacting with this little chimp. You know, I wasn't much bigger, bigger than this baby chimp. And, um, you know, he was passing me food and stuff and I didn't want to eat the food, so I it over. And then all of a sudden, this hell of a noise. It was like a fire jet cutting through the sky. Uh, and the scream was, I can still hear the scream today. And um, it, was the, it was the chimp's mother, um, which then made a beeline for me, you know, on the attack. Um, and uh, it basically leaped over the baby chimp, pinned me to the floor and started ripping chunks out of me, um, which at 10 years old was absolutely hell. Um, but the thing is, I did, I locked away that the detail of that attack mm -hmm. up until last year. And, you know, it's only when I turned and faced it last year and had a, I went away to Costa Rica to a, a retreat. And it's only then I went back and went through the emotional detail of what happened. And it was quite traumatic to do that. But it's, it's really changed, um, yeah, changed my outlook on everything. And, and, and really unraveled that whole incident. So, you know, the important thing there is not, you know, I don't, it's not about me telling, oh, it's me, me, me about, it's, it's about when we do have any kind of trauma, first of all, you do need to address it and you have to face it. And secondly, a lot of the problem comes from the fact that a lot of people, they have a traumatic incident and they're, they're fighting after the incident to try and be, get back to the person they were prior to the incident. You're never going to be that person again. So the more you fight to be who you used to be, the more conflict that's going on up here. So, yeah, I mean, that's how it all started 10 years old and that, and then looking back in hindsight, you know, hindsight never won any wars, but I, I saw how significant that attack was throughout my whole life. You know, the trail of destruction, chasing death, you know, just the, just the, the mayhem of my life um, that happened after that 10 year old attack. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it unfolded, you know, and then 30, still 38 years later, well, 30, 30, uh, about 37 years later, I was still dealing with it. I'm conscious a lot of people say we're six minutes from clapping for the NHS. So I was going to go to the window and clap out of the window while we carry on talking. So yeah. That's the joy of having these conversations on phones. But you, that was sort of the first chapter, like literally and, and metaphorically for you. Yeah. Then you went on, you know, you successfully, you know, great career in the SBS, which I'm sure had all manner of stories that you probably can't unpack in this book. But for a lot of people, they might be surprised to know that it was actually the next phase of your life is the thing where you really sort of found your calling, for want of a better word. Yeah. Why? 100%. Yeah. Were you surprised, having made it through selection and having mm. your career, that actually 
I mean, you described it, but I, I, I get the impression it was almost a bit underwhelming. Yeah, well, but the thing is, I didn't find my purpose, you know, and that's important. You've got to find your purpose in life. And that, for me, I talked about before, chasing an image, change, chasing stuff. The image for me was that, like, action man lifestyle and, you know, James Bond and everything. And that, for me, I chased that image and I got there and it wasn't, it didn't fulfill me. There was something missing. So, and I, I'm not afraid to say that, you know, and I don't look back and I don't just, I'm not living on my laurels of, of, of the special forces. I did that. That was part of my life. It was good. I'm so proud I did it, but it really, it, it was preparing me for the biggest battle ahead. And that was with myself years later. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I felt deflated when I came out of that, you know, I lost all my, all my sort of uh, support networks and everything. Uh, and then I went on a, uh, a flat spin for, for years and years trying to find my feet. And, and it lasted te at least 10 years before I started to get some stability. I commend you on your honesty, like your honesty about your relationships and like your battle with alcohol. And I mean, do some of your ex-partners know that they feed you in this book? Did you speak to them about, you know, the way you were going to... It's honest, it's not. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, I've, I've tried to be, you know, at the end of the day, I've tried, you know, I've tried to be as fair as possible. So, but, you know, my history is my history. And, you know, I'd like to think that we've all moved on. So, um, yeah. Except for a reason, Ollie, but it does make for a fascinating yeah. read. For the women who are tuning into this and thinking, oh, I prefer a bit of a soap opera, there's plenty of that, isn't there? <laughs> um, talk to me about The Great Man, because that must have been... Yeah, and that's really where it took me, you know, afterwards, that, that's, that's the, that was the next phase. And that was really, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd left it, I'd, after I left the military, I got drawn back into that world. I spent six, seven years as a contractor in Iraq, which was absolutely, absolute mayhem. I didn't think I'd come back from that place. Um, it was just like, um, yeah, there was no support. It was, it was, it was like the Wild West. Did you um, think you were gonna die when you were doing those contracts? Were there times? Again, you, sorry. Were there times when you were doing the contracts that you're thinking, this is the end? I'm not gonna see another day. Yeah, there was, there was, there was a couple of particular incidents that happened, and uh, and that's why I say I didn't think I'd come back from there because it, you know, like I say, things happened, and then it was just like we didn't. I was, you know, back in the military, we were used to, we could. We could call in an airstrike, you could call in naval gunfire, you had all the weapons, you had all the mates around you, you felt invincible, but out there you just have no support. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, we, every day we sort of, we got complacent with it to be quite, it's a, it was a dangerous place to be in, a dangerous mindset to be in. So, uh, and then I came across the, the grey man, you know, I left there, managed to get away from there, tried to get some normality and that didn't work. And then I heard about, um, you know, the amount of kids in Southeast Asia, 1.6 million a year that being sold into slavery and prostitution. And, um, you know, I used to complain about not getting a hug off my dad, but these kids are sold by the families. And it really, that really affected me. And I thought I wanted to be a part of um, trying to prevent that or help some of these kids. Um, so we went over to Thailand and we were busting kids out of these camps where they were being held uh, and being sold into slavery and prostitution. Um, cut a long story short, it, uh, it went sour because the uh, Thai government and the, uh, and the US State Department actually um, got in a bit of a uh, heated argument about um, what was going on. We'd done more than they'd done in years to prevent any kind of, of, of what was going on and we had to basically escape out of Thailand. But that's why I say, you know, that, that whole thing, I left there with nothing. I, all the money I made from Iraq, I, I funded that myself. And, um, and I ended up um, on the run out of Thailand, back in Australia then. And um, at that point, but one thing I did leave with is the fact that, you know, the power of helping other people. And that really laid the foundation for my company, Breakpoint, which is the whole aim is to, to help people. But how difficult was it finding, you know, you were helping these young girls out of a life in sex slavery and then their whole operation fell apart you've seen yourself doing good and then yeah. it fell apart. is it is that a difficult thing to get your head around because it must be you've been so close to it and you were stopping it and then you've got to just let it all carry on yeah no it was not it, it tore me apart to be quite honest I came back and that's that that was my lowest moment and then that was that was the point you know where you know I talk about it in battle ready it was the point where I came back, I just had nothing and my whole world fell apart. And it was really, I, I, I went below zero, sub zero. And it was really from that point uh, that I had to back up to try and get back to where I needed to be. But do we need to, I think we've got to clap for the NHS, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to the window. I'm going to go to the window then. This every week, this makes me so emotional.
Still clapping for the NHS becoming. I am, but there's no one here though. I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Oh gosh, it makes me cry every single week because I'm such a soppy sod. Literally every week I'm like, oh, I can't take this anymore. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> difficult, difficult times for everybody. But, but again, I mean, this is why it's such a relevant time for this book to come out because I think. I mean, how confident are you that people who are struggling with lockdown, because there will be a lot of people struggling with yeah. the anxieties and the uncertainties, how confident are you that they can use this book as a tool to kind of get their heads around what's going on? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the book is there. It's a, it's a, it's a tool to, to, like I said, it's a call to action. <coughs> Murph, calm down. It's a, it's a call to action. So, you know, this, this book can be used 100% to give your day some structure make some changes now and that's that's the thing i the processes i put into play there were for a period that i put myself into self-isolation like i said there were no distractions or anything to make those changes we're in that moment now when i was actually in that two months i i was thinking you know when it, when, when do we ever get this opportunity again with no distractions to lock yourself away so i, I felt fortunate everyone's in that circumstance now so the thing is, I keep, I keep saying to people, ask, have a conversation with yourself in six months and ask yourself, you're, you're facing yourself and say to yourself, what did you do in isolation? You know, be honest with yourself. And if that person is saying, I ate too much, I drank too much, I didn't do any training and I spent all day on my phone, then you need to address that because you need to come out of this. I, mean, I think there is going to be some mental health concerns after this blows over and it, there will be a sort of, you know, a bit of a mushroom cloud. Oh, this is the biggest concern for me. Yeah. How is alcohol and social media in your life? And if so, how big are they? Um, alcohol is not in my life. And this is a non-alcoholic cider. Is it as good? <laughs> yeah, it's really great. Zero but do you think percent... that's been key to you changing things? Thing is, right, alcohol for me, everyone thinks, you know, everyone gets the impression that I was a screaming alcoholic and that wasn't the case. For me, um, alcohol just... It, it depleted my creativity, it depleted my productivity, and I just wasn't getting the best out of myself. I realized how powerful this is, and I didn't want to corrupt it with anything. So, and really, it's just, it's just a personal thing to me. You know, people haven't got to stop drinking, but I think any, 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 any excess of anything is, is, is not good. You know, and, and if it comes to alcohol, I think, um, you know, you've got to be careful because, like I say, it does, it does stop you from creating and being productive and and um, making the most of your time. So really, I do have social media. I don't drink, but I do have social media. But I feel at the moment with isolation, it's quite weird because I would have assumed that I would be on my phone a lot more, but I'm, I'm pushing it further and further away. Every day, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting annoyed because I'm trying to get things done. And you know, I've, I've got to go to my phone, go to my phone. I do get quite, you know, I'm getting annoyed with it. And I'm pushing my phone further and further away. But um, I've, even, I've even thought time. about buying a burner phone. Yeah. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> Big yeah, call. Then, your, then your fiance will be like, "What's that for?" That's yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. That's, exactly. Exactly. That's how we work. So, what is it for you at the minute then that is making? So, obviously, you know, when you were involved with the Grey Man, that gave you purpose. You, yeah. you bounced around different things and you felt a bit lost. Obviously, at the minute, you, you've done all this on the back of feeling purpose. What is it for you that is making everything click? Where are you finding purpose now? Purpose is basically, I mean, we, we've got a company. I do, I've got a, um, some business interests with Foxy from the show. Loads um, of people are asking, where's Foxy? <laughs> Foxy? Foxy had to cut and run. He had a uh, essential trip he had to make. So basically, he's, he's gone back home. So, but we had a great time up here together. You know, we like to say we've got some business interests together. But really, I've got Breakpoint. So Breakpoint does, we do corporate training. We do, um, we do public courses. Um, and basically, regardless of what we do, everything's the same theme. We help people break through those limiting beliefs. We help them achieve more and we help them achieve their goals. So we put them through processes, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, it, it's brilliant to see that development of people come through the, through the courses and everything. So, and a lot of that is, is workshop based. It's not physical stuff. It's nothing like the TV show. It's actually, you'd enjoy it. <laughs> Even you'd enjoy it. Well, you'd enjoy it loads anyway. I know, I know what you like. But that's then, what a lot of people are probably thinking. I'd like to book the company in, but they don't want to see their company secretary. Yeah, but it's, it's not like that. I mean, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the corporates, we, we actually do, um, psychometric character assessment. So we um, 
they have a pre-assessment so they get to learn their characters. We go through all, through all the planning processes, all the, um, all the mindset stuff. And with, there's a small practical bit at the end. So it's not really about, it's nothing to do. Because people, they see it break, they see Breakpoint, they see the show and they think, Jesus, we haven't got the, uh, you know, HR is like that. No, we can't do that. But everyone that comes through absolutely loves it. And then the most important project we've got, which is absolutely brilliant, we've been working on it for two years, is the Breakpoint Academy. And that is basically taking veterans, um, you know, people that have served our country, putting them through a three-day course. And that's the same thing as well. You know, we, we're basically making these people, uh, making these people battle ready to go into employment. So the, the, uh, we've partnered up with an amazing company called Orion Rail. Um, and we're supplying um, key workers for Network Rail. So that's, a, that's an amazing project still running at the moment. We've got our guys out there on the front line. We've taken them from the front line in a war zone. They're now on the front line in the UK working as key workers. So that is an amazing project and something we're doing, you know, uh, moving forward. It's a, it's a big focus for us. I'm loving the, some of the comments that people are saying. Fiona just said, who would have thought people get paid to get, people would pay to get beasted? You are a genius. Um, <laughs> We don't like, beast you. <laughs> <laughs> we promise. We only put a bag over your head and took water in your face. Um, no, you don't do that, I'm sure. But, but actually, there'll be a lot of people for whom this is relevant and the books are relevant because there's lots of people who think, I'd like to make a change or I'm not really doing something that fulfills me. But it's scary because they have the financial commitments and they have the lifestyle and they have the pension. But I guess what you're all about is giving people the confidence to, to, to create the life they want. Yeah, 100%. I think, I think there's a couple of things here because I do appreciate it. It's, it's, it's all right. A lot of people will say, well, you know, I've, I've got, I'm tied down with a mortgage, this, that and the other. But, you know, there's one thing. If you're not getting the fulfillment from work, you know, if it's not, it's, if, it's not um, uh, if you don't believe it's your purpose, but it's paying the bills and everything else, then you've got to try and find something outside of work that does fit your purpose. You know, so, um, you know, there has to be something more. I mean, to get up on a Monday morning and think, oh, I'm just doing this, going through the, going through the, uh, the motions just to pay the bills. I mean, that, that's a dreary, dreary place to be. So if you have got that, it's really about creating. And it can be something small. It can be something, but it's got to be something personal to you. And whether that's a sport or whether that's, you know, I don't know, you know, any kind of thing. But trying to have something that really uh, ticks a box for you when it comes to your purpose. How important is it to embrace fears? The thing is with fear and uh, fear and any kind of emotion, they're all contagious. So, you know, one thing about being in the special forces, it's not that we, we have no fear. It's not that we don't have emotion. It's not that we don't have any kind of uh, ego. It's the fact that we can recognize we're, 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 we, 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 we're in touch with our emotions. We can, uh, we understand them. We know when to switch them on and switch them off. So really, when it comes to fear, it's not about um, it's not about being you know it's about accepting fear. It's about understanding the emotion, and really um, applying it if it's if it's uh, needed at that moment in time. But you know, we're, the way we're wired again. You know, I've looked I, I looked a lot of or thought and read a lot about evolution. We're geared to look for anything that could go wrong. Okay, so anything when it comes to anything new, you will always focus on what could go wrong. Everyone does it. And that's, that's basically that, you know, that's, that's just our survival instinct. It's just the way we're wired. But really, you know, when you know that's happening, it's about recognizing it. It's about accepting it, appreciating it, but choosing whether you need to align with it. And what it is, is I always say it's like you become an emotional observer and not, not a victim of your emotions. You're clearly a philosopher. You can tell that in even just turning some of the pages that you, the things you come out with. But I didn't realise how spiritual you are. Yeah. How yeah. important is that to, to you? No, it's greatly important. I read a book. There was a, I, I was starting to ask a lot of questions, um, you know, when it comes to your ego and stuff. And I started to question why I was doing things when they didn't align with me. And that was really all about the ego. I was identifying and separating from the ego a bit. And I, I then I read a book by a guy called Eckhart Tolle, which was amazing. It changed my life. And it was like, a, it was called A New Earth. And this book really resonated to me. And it was really about recognizing your ego and, and, and really following, you know, trying to find your true self. So that for me is like, 
spirituality for me is about recognizing your ego. It's about really starting to be getting into some mindful practices and really starting to, to focus and look inwards. And that's what I do on a daily basis. I think it's so important. You know, I do meditation. Um, you know, my whole attitude, I've got an attitude of gratitude. I, you know, I've got positive affirmations, everything I use. And um, it just creates a lot more of a positive balance. And I just find that once you start doing that and investing in yourselves, a lot more opportunities come your way. But a lot of that stuff mm. is, is at odds with the stereotypical image we have yeah. of the, the DS, that you, you know, the character that you portray on SAS Who Dares Wins. And I don't mean that to say the character that like you're playing a role. Yeah. But the one thing everybody says to me about that, you know, having done the one in October is, are they as mean as they, mm. are, they, are, they are they that bad? Are they that mean? I think people are surprised at that, that character. Why you haven't stated you do your answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you do SAS Who Dares Wins? What do you get out of it? Um, well, really, like, initially, we, we, you know, the, when we initially got approached, I said yes straight away because it was, it was a perfect platform to launch, launch a company. You know, so it's for exposure. I had no real belief in it. I didn't understand the purpose of it. Um, and then after the way I saw they did the first edit, I realised how powerful that show was. Foxy went on there. He talked about having PTSD. I saw the effect that had on the whole nation. And then I realised the power of that show. The show's about psychology. It's about human psychology. And it addresses so many topics that people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, not just veterans. So, you know, the power of the show is amazing. And, and that's why we love doing it. You know, we, we love what we've created. And we love how it inspires people. We're inundated with emails of people that, you know, the show changes their life. It inspires them to do better things. So that is, is, is amazing for us to have that kind of feedback. Do, when you're in it, though, do you ever think, hang on a minute, this isn't actually the SAS. Are we going too far here? Because people do get broken. Yeah, well, honestly, well, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, the thing is, the show is very much like that. I had that conversation today. The fact of the matter is we are running it so tight to the line. But the thing is, we are, we do feel that we're experts in knowing when it's gone too far. And it is a knife edge of pushing it to, but it's, that's why the show is so successful because we have it on that knife edge. You know, it's, it's, it's if it was too little, then it, everyone would see through it. If it was too much, it just wouldn't work and people would get hurt, but it's just on the edge. And sometimes we have pushed it, you know, I mean, there was a couple of times, I, mean, I remember one time when we were in Chile in the mountains and uh, we got them to jump in a freezing cold pool. And, and pretty much the whole course nearly went down with hypothermia. And we were, th we were looking at each other with wide eyes thinking, you know, have, have, we, have we pushed it too far? But yeah, it's, it's about pushing it as far as we can without it being too brutal. Is it, teachers say they don't have favourites, but they do. And parents yeah. say they don't have a favourite kid, but they do. <laughs> do you guys, when you, when you see everybody over the first couple of days, you're thinking, yeah, I hope they make it through and I'll be happy when they go. Yeah, I mean... I can't say that we don't because we do, you know, but the thing is, if, you know, if you, if, that usually only comes though when, we've, when you've got one bad apple upsetting the rest of the car, you know, because if that, if, and that's, that relates to us back in the military, we didn't, it's not about liking everyone you used to work with because that never used to happen, but it's about, you know, it's, it's about how a team molds together and they, you know, regardless of whether they like each other or not, it's about, can they push all that stuff to one side and get the job done and it, that 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 only comes where we go we wish that person would go if that one person is affecting the rest of the group because we know how bad that can be you you guys I should turn this question in on you now you guys look like you have fun though and what, what's unbelievable in that environment and i've said this to so many people is no, I respect what you guys have done, but in no other walk of life would you let four blokes who you don't really know come up to you, scream in your face all kinds of obscenities and tell you to get in a freezing cold pool of water. And not only do you do it, you're desperate to do it so quick just for like a little nod of approval. It's, it's an unbelievable psychological shift. Yeah, but why, I tell you what, you tell us, why, why, why do you do that? Why did you do it, Helen? And why did you not tell us to do one? Because you want to prove, in the first instance, the first bit of it is that you want to, you want to feel like you're part of the gang, so you want to do it 
to be like in with the gang because everyone else is doing mm. it but I think you also want to prove to yourself that you're as, as tough as can be and like life throws everybody no matter how rich how poor how healthy mm. how I think life throws everybody challenges they don't want to deal with you know yeah. you lose people you have your heart broken you, you lose a job you lose money whatever and and for me doing SAS who dares wins it's like good training for life like yeah. I, I've had times in my life where shitty things have happened and, yeah. that, and when they happen, I end up going out and like running a massive marathon or kayaking down big rivers because I need to say to myself, if this takes me to the most horrific place ever, I've got experience and I'll be good enough and strong enough to deal with anything that life throws at me. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And, and tell, us, tell me, because I know we had a bit of a conversation earlier, how, what is your thoughts post SAS who dares wins? Is it, is it, you know, I know you mentioned, you know, because um, you've done other TV shows, other reality shows, uh, similar kind of things. How is, how is SAS different for you? Oh, Jack Maynard's just joined. Hello, Jack. Hello, Jack. Yeah, so how is it different for you, from you, for you, you know, after, you know, how, how, how is it, has, the, has there been an everlasting kind of effect? Has, has SAS left you? Have you left SAS? No, I think what's, what's been really good for me coming out of SAS, I really, I identified and had a lot of love for Lauren because mm. Lauren said things and I hope she takes this not, pa I don't mean it patronising and I don't mean it, I, I mean and in that I liked it, she kept saying things like, oh, we want them to push us hard so that we experience the pain so we're ready for it. And I thought, I used to say things like that. And like, mm. I used to really want to be at the front of the pack and, and I was really scared about how I'd feel if I wasn't. And actually, yeah. you know, I don't want to give the game away because the series is not finished, but I wasn't at the front of the pack all the time. And what I took away from SAS is, I wasn't the best, but I'm all right with that. Like I, yeah. I was, I'm kind of comfortable with, I loved it when the others did stuff they didn't think they could do. And, and that for me was a big surprise. I was like, I'm all right with being not a loser, but do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the thing is that's, that's the people that we are looking for. Everyone, a lot of people coming on the show and a lot, and, and especially when you do special forces selection, you actually think that you've got to be the front runner. You actually think that, mm -hmm. you know, the, you actually think that the DS want to see the front runner all the time, but the, just, because, just because you're at the front doesn't mean that you're the best. It doesn't yeah. mean that you're digging out 100%. You know, there could be someone in the, in the middle of the pack that's given 110%, and that front runner is, is cruising. So really, it's, it's not about, you know, and we talk a lot about the gray man, being the gray man. I mean, and that is the perfect fit for, for someone um, in the special forces. You know, it's someone that sort of blends in the middle of the pack doesn't stand out too much uh, and that's really the the um that's sort of the perfect candidate it it's so it's so good timing that this book has come out now because i think a lot of people will be able to use it as a little bit of a a guide and a bit of something to draw strength from and i think what's useful is that you can dip in and out if there are people who don't want to change every aspect of their life but maybe want to use the time to be a bit positive what are the you know, one or two exercises or tips you would encourage them to do tomorrow this week this weekend yeah well there's two things i'm gonna go i'm gonna state two things there um first of all um a lot of people will have anxiety at the moment they'll have um you know they'll they'll, they'll be worrying a lot so really if you are that if that is you i want you to think about writing a list of all the things you're worrying about okay and once you've done that then separate that list cross out the things that you can't control okay to so cross the things out you can't control and then try and disengage them because at the end of the day, if you can't control them, why worry about them? You know, we can't worry about the external stuff at the moment, but what we can focus on and we can control is what we do personally. So really start to just focus on the things you can control and forget the things you can't because you're wasting energy. Secondly, there's, a, there's an exercise in the book, which is really, it really helped me massively. And at one point, so I, I got a CD I drew around the seat. It's actually in the, the exercises in the book. Yeah. You can actually go to my website, ollieollerton.co.uk, and you can download these anyway. Um, and that's for people really, if they're, if they're reading the, you know, listen to the audio book, you can still download the exercises. But basically I drew a CD, so around a CD, I dissected it like a clock. I put a 12, I put a, th a three, a six and a nine. At the 12 o'clock position, I put my main goal, my focus, what, something I wanted to achieve. Now that for me was, was really starting to create the business and everything. And, and from where I was at that time, that seemed like 
a bizarre goal to have. How could that ever happen? So what I did then, at the three o'clock position, I put my first step towards that goal, okay? And then you can break it down even further. So what have I got on the clock hands, one and two? What are the two steps I've got to take to get to three? So that's all I focused on, one to three of that clock. And once I got to three, I then drew on the six, my next milestone. And everything was stepping closer and closer to, to number 12, which was my main goal. 12 months later, I succeeded everything on that clock. And, and I, I guess I know the answer to this, but that 12 o'clock goal doesn't have to be becoming a neurosurgeon. It doesn't have to be running a marathon. It could be getting my washing done on time every week or cleaning my windows once a week. It can be little things, right? Thing is, with the big goal, I say in the start of the book, no goal was ever great unless at some point you doubted your ability to achieve it. So yeah. really, that is your main goal. But the thing is, you know, your main goal should be, it's not like something that should be obvious. That's like, you know, you don't want to do it like for me, right, next week I'm going to run 100 metres. Everyone knows I can run 100 metres. So for me, it's about creating a goal that scares you a bit. But the thing is, look, even if you don't make it to the goal, even if you get 25% towards that goal, it's 25% more than zero. But the thing is, you've got to have something, a goal that you can then break down and you can focus on the small chunks. There's a lot of people saying just surviving the day at the minute is a goal. And that's fair enough. A lot of people, uh, do you know, I think that's a valid question. Yes. Um, talking of goals, obvious question, but all of your fans will want to know, what is next for you? What are your next goals? Well, my next goal is to progress exactly what we've done now. So we've got, me and Foxy have got the Battle Ready 360 Fitness app, Mind, Body and Nutrition. So we've got all these projects uh, that we're pushing along. The Breakpoint Academy for Veterans, that's the biggest push for us, working with the Ryan Rail. Um, so that's only just start, just before lockdown, we've got our first course up and running and we've got our first guys actually out there working now. Um, so really, it's to, my goal at the start of the year was to have the Breakpoint Academy up and running. And I made that goal bang on the day because I set the goal. Um, so really, it's about progressing everything we're doing and making it bigger and better. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> obviously, your experience with PTSD, what's going on at the minute? Everybody, like we just have, everybody's gone outside and clapped and said, you know, rightly so, acknowledge what people are doing on the front line. But a lot of people just want to show that they're doing something. Is this what we should be doing? If we've got or we know NHS or frontline people in our lives, in order to mitigate that potential PTSD, what should we be doing as the wider public? I think, I think really, um, you know, not just with NHS though, I think, I think really with everyone. I think what everyone's got to do, you know, that when we were in the Special Forces, we used to work in small four-man teams, but we would never break less than two. Oh. And I really think it's so important at the moment that you, everyone connects and makes sure that everyone's all right and everyone checks in with each other. It's like Foxy uh, was with me, obviously, for four weeks. He's now gone, but we check in all the time. I get a text message, you know, at random times from Foxy saying, are you okay, mate? You know, and it's just that confirmation. It's just knowing that someone's got your back is really supportive. So I just think, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of, if you know someone that's working in the NHS, yeah, they're on the front line, they need a lot of support. Um, and maybe they don't, maybe they're, they're handling it well, but just check in with them. And even if you think someone's doing all right, just check in. It does no harm just to send a message. I just love Foxy's demeanour all the time. <laughs> like, is he always like that? Like in real life, is he always like, what the hell's going on now? Yeah, like, we spent four, he spent four weeks like that here. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he just, yeah, I don't know. Dower is not probably a word that you use down south, but it's just so applicable to Foxy. <laughs> um, and I've got to be honest, Billy scares the life out of me. He scares the life out of me. <laughs> um, and big ambitious plans for SAS because you should have been filming in Australia. Yeah, we should have. We'll be back there soon, though. Well, New Zealand uh, for Australian TV. Um, and we are hopefully back. You know, everything's unpredictable at the moment. We don't, we don't know what's going on. But, you know, we, we certainly plan to get back out there and uh, bring the people what they want. <laughs> um, yeah, I can do that thing now that, you know, like, they always say everybody who's sitting in the stands at a football match is an expert. And I'd be like, yes, no, they should <laughs> You can, but I'd like, I want to say absolutely amazing. I'm not going to give the game away, but you did amazing. You were brilliant. 
So, and I'd like to really thank you for, for doing this session with me. That's, that's really, um, I really uh, can't thank you enough. It is an absolute honour of all the things, God, this is the blowing smoke, lovey dovey bit, isn't it? But of all the things that um, I've been lucky enough to be part of, for crying out loud, I've met the Queen once. That's not a brag, but that's just to put into context. My husband's friends are like, oh, what, are you doing that in person? I was like, no, I'm not doing it in person. We're <laughs> locked down, you bonkers idiot. But yeah, you, I think you have an army of fans because people identify with what you're saying and it's practical advice to just help people. So thank you for your honesty. Thank you for sharing your stories. I thought that I might like this book, but I love it. So congratulations on a brilliant read and, and really useful advice. So the book's out now. You can order it. You can enjoy it. You can devour it already and you can back it up in the second one ollie thank you and hats off thank you thank you very much helen thank you to everyone that listened and thank you to walter stones a lot of love to murph he yeah there. and to, what's your dog's name spider-man oh that's it spider-man how could i forget that <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. right murph come in come and say come on come on up here, up here. Come here. My dog come is the me. only male in this house I've got control of. And there's yeah. three. Uh, oh, I love him. Time taking a yeah. picture. He's, um, he's feeling a bit needy at the moment. I don't know what's going on, but that's all right. They, all right. Because they said. Right, Ollie, lovely to talk to you. Thank all right, you take so care. Love to talk